Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are tuning in today. Welcome to this special Reuters events webinar on your next big business strategy, cross-border payments. Today, we're talking about the real challenges and benefits of implementing a cross-border payment strategy. Whether you're a tier one to three financial institution or a small regional bank early on your cross-border payments journey, we're here to deep dive into the key trends, challenges, and opportunities that cross-border payments presents. I'd like to thank all our panelists and our sponsor Visa for organizing this webinar in partnership with Reuters events. And let's kick off and do a round of intros with the panelists. Richard, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rich Mazaros. I am Vice President, Head of Cross-Border Money Movement and I lead the commercialization strategy and business growth for our North America Visa Direct team. Uh, Visa Direct is Visa's real-time money movement network that enables fast, simple, and secure digital payments in 190 countries, 160 currencies, and across 7 billion card, account, and wallet endpoints worldwide. In fiscal year 22, we processed nearly 6 billion payments across 2,000 live programs and over 60 live use cases. So at Visa, I am focused on helping our partners stand up and grow their cross-border programs to meet their customer needs. Keith, I'd like to pass over to you. Thanks, Rich, and thanks, Visa, for sponsoring and, and Reuters for hosting. Um, I lead the payments team here at Cross River. Um, payments, we talk about payment rails. We've got our bank rails, that's ACHRTP, and wires, soon to be fed now, and then we've got our card rails. Card rails is pushed cards, so Visa Direct, um, and then merchant acquiring, so that's, that's been sponsorship. Um, the payments business at Crossover has has grown out of our, our core business, which is our lending, and, and that's not the typical lending that you think of with a bank. It's it's fintech lending, so uh, we call it marketplace lending, but that's typically uh, more commonly known as buy now, pay later programs. Um, our clients in that space, we're looking for faster and faster forms of money movement, dispersing loans and servicing those loans. So we built out core competencies around ACH. We're an early uh, sponsor of, of Push to Card um, and then built up competencies around that and started to do standalone uh, payments programs without the lending component. So that's that's what the payments business is. Uh, I've been at Cross River for three and a half years, was at American Express prior to that, working in both the issuing and the acquiring business. And prior to American Express, I was at First Data, um, doing a variety of different things. Um, most relevant probably was spend a little bit of time with their telecheck business, if anyone uh, remembers that business. But um, happy to be here and I'll turn it over to Hal. Great. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, wherever you may be. Nice to uh, have everybody here and attend today. My name is Hal Romakers. I'm the SVP of Global Solutions for Brightwell. We're a fintech based out of uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I've been with Brightwell now for 13 years. Um, and over that 13 years, we uh, have been best known for a solution that we built to pay the global cruise line employees. Um, digitally. And through that, we uh, built a platform um, that is integrated into five different remittance providers today. Um, and have now we, we probably have about a 60 or 65% market share in that business. Um, we've evolved our company now to really be able to enable banks, corporations, and other fintechs to, to be able to do the remittance components um, that we built in the last 10 years. So if you will, rather than us going out and looking for other niche markets, um, we actually want to enable the, the banks and the, the program managers and corporations to be able to implement cross-border payments yourself through a new service and platform that we have called Ready Remit. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you very much, Hal, and for the rest of the panelists introducing yourself. We're gonna kick things off here with a poll question to gauge the kind of audience demographic and breakdown. So we're just gonna dive into the first question. 
So if you could just share where you're kind of tuning in from, what region you, you represent. I was going to try to vote and says that uh, we can't vote. The panelists can't vote. So. And then the second question, just while we're there, is what functional area does your role represent in your company? Okay, just a few seconds left on this, and then I'll share the results with the panelists. So it looks like quite a predominantly North American, a Canadian um, audience of around 70%, but we've got some um, people tuning in from Europe and Latin America, which is, which is great to see. Okay. So yeah, you can see that there. And so just to kick things off, I think it'd be a really interesting place to start to understand what has changed, what has progressed, and where are we right now in 2023 with cross-border payments? It's a huge untapped opportunity for businesses, for corporates, and for individuals with their remittances uh, sending money abroad. So Rich, it'd be great to understand from your perspective the kind of work you're doing at Visa Direct to, to kind of tap into this opportunity. Sure, James, thank you. Um, I think where I'd like to start, I'd like to first of all, start with a little bit of the opportunity because I think it's it's really important for us to understand the size of the cross-border market. So the first number I wanted to kind of um, mention here is 7 trillion. And that is the global payment volume opportunity for cross-border payments, 7 trillion. And North America represents about a third of that global number for about $2.3 trillion in cross-border payments that are originating out of North America. Now this includes um, B2C and B2SB payments. It also includes core P2P remittance business as well. But let's look at a little bit of how that, um, how that shakes out. If you look at that 2.3 trillion coming out of North America, about 433 billion of that is SMB payables use case. Uh, 295 billion is marketplaces. So this is um, seller payouts or host payouts for online marketplaces that are that are going from the marketplace to the individual that's actually selling the goods or providing their property um, on that marketplace. And then service providers is 94 billion. And that's you know things like your gig economy workers. Now, remittances is about an $800 billion um, payment volume global market opportunity with about $200 billion of that coming from North America alone. And North America is the single largest remittance market outbound in the world. You know, speaking a little bit more on remittances, um, <clears throat> recently Visa released its 2023 digital remittance adoption report where we surveyed 14,000 remittance senders and receivers across 10 countries. And there's a couple of key things that we found here that I want to um, use to kind of set up our conversation here. First of all is, is consumers see the future as digital. In fact, 53% of the surveyed customers report using a digital app to send and receive funds around the world. This is in comparison of using a physical um, bank or branch location at 34%, sending cash, uh, checks, or money orders at 12%, or giving money to another person and traveling, that's traveling to their home country at 11%. So you can see that over half of customers are using now digital apps to be able to, to support their remittance needs. And then the other thing that I think is really important for us to, to mention here is, even though when you look at the 800 billion remittance PV opportunity to the 7 trillion, global cross-border uh, payment volume, you still have about a third of consumers that send a remittance on some level of frequency. And so what we are talking about here is very frequent transactions that may be lower value, and that's why the PV is a little bit lower, but there's a tremendous number of customers that send these transactions on a regular basis for friends and to friends and family for you know, 
general maintenance of like food, housing, education. And if you look at your data within your institution, you probably see that these customers are using your debit cards to be able to fund these transactions. They're just not doing these transactions with you. Rich, I think that's a really great point that, you, that you're bringing up. And I can kind of mirror that for what we've seen at Brightwell with our cruise line employees, um, especially in the last three, four years as we've gone through COVID, we've, saw the, we've seen the advancement of digitization probably move five years ahead faster than what anybody would have anticipated. And, you know, before COVID, we saw, we still had a good number of crew members who may get off, in a, off the ship and, and go to retail locations or, you know, or even send money home in, in their pockets with their friends, whatever it might be. Um, through COVID now, we see probably 20, 25% increases um, in the adoption of the, of the digital services. And, you know, as you mentioned, um, even the, the frequency of those payments continues to just pick up. So 100% agree with everything that you're saying on those numbers. Yeah, I, th I think the other thing that that we've seen is because it's digital now, everyone's got got a smartphone. Um, it's truly 24-7. We live in a 24-7, 365 economy. People's work and uh, personal lives are being blended together. They no longer expect to be tied to the traditional banking hours of nine to five, nine to six. They want the money when they when they want it. Um, and and pushed card Visa Direct enables them to receive those funds whenever. Right. I, I think um, the the payment rails like ACH and wires that are tied to the bank hours will um, need to figure out a way to to adapt to this new economy. Um, yes, they're they're digital in a way, but but they're not 24 seven 365. I think um, that's one of the, the benefits of, of Visa Direct um, that that many of our fintech clients are are seeing and, and exploiting. So Keith, you, you raised something that I think is really important for us to dig into is, is the whole issue around consumer preferences have changed. And Hal, you mentioned this too, that's being driven by, was driven by the pandemic. But I think we saw that trend even before the pandemic and the pandemic just accelerated that. And that is that consumers really are looking for ways to be able to um, send money more easily and to be able to have access to be able to send anytime, anywhere. And that also includes the speed and the uh, flexibility of being able to actually receive the funds in other methods than just traditionally cash. You know, if you think back, you know, even five years ago, remittances were still largely paid out in cash. But obviously with the pandemic where you had shuttering of institutions or shuttering of stores, for instance, to pick up cash, you know, customers had to migrate to being able to send money directly into an account or to a card that uh, effectively deposits money into an account, or even now into wallets, which are becoming prevailing, the prevailing uh, commerce vehicle within many markets around the world. So I think that's a really important aspect here is that consumers expect the speed, the ease, the, the flexibility of kind of digital first offerings. And oftentimes they look at kind of digital experiences such as Uber and Amazon, and be able to apply that simplicity to how they send money. And oftentimes consumers are very focused on, why can't I send money as easily as I can send an email around the world? Rich, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And I wanna kind of piggyback together two different concepts you brought up. One is that I think a lot of financial institutions, whether you're a bank, whether you're a credit union, whether you're a, a debit card or a program manager provider of a, of a prepaid card, um, a lot of people don't understand that their users are actually going and finding these services. If you don't have them available today in your app, it's not because your users don't want to use the service. They are going out and they are finding third parties who can provide those services digitally. And they are leaving your ecosystem, which puts you at risk of, of, losing, a, of losing a customer. Um, and I think that's a critical piece because a lot of people don't realize that, you know, when you're going out and, and, and doing business with a, a third party money services business, right, 
um, you're not just losing the transaction. A lot of those businesses today are also building their own banking solutions and they are trying to capture that customer. So not only are you at risk of not keeping the transaction, you really have a, a customer that's at risk today. And I think that's that's the core of what you really need to look at is looking at your data. I can tell you that one of our clients on our platform, um, you know, in addition to um, not offering remittance services before, um, finally took a look at their data and they saw that they had 15, 20% of their users that were doing these transactions. Then they started realizing that a lot of their ATM transactions were actually you know, costing them money, but they were losing the transactions. They were losing the revenue opportunities. So there, there's, there's an awful lot of complexity in, in what happens when a user leaves your, your ecosystem. I think it's really important from a from a brand perspective. You know, the the primary financial institution for for consumers, um, there is a a brand affinity. But we've seen an increase in in neo banks or banking as a service fintech providers, and and there's probably been a um, too much of a proliferation, right? Like the 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 bank for dog walkers or or you name it affinity group is is probably not sustainable but the the underbanked and and um unbanked population who has also a brand affinity to their remittance provider or or someone who can provide remittances and sometimes it's very specific to a a unique corridor um and a unique uh population geography, um, there's been success in that type of fintech. Um, they're bringing technology to bear. They're bringing um, a great customer experience. And there is risk for the more traditional um, community banks, the, the FIs, the, the credit unions, to lose um, that, that customer, not only from the remittance business, but also from the deposits business. And their check business, their payroll business, you know, everything else that um, traditional banks and, and credit unions um, value in those customer relationships. So I, I absolutely agree that making this available if you are a, a community bank um, or a credit union is, is something that it's key to, to retaining those customers. You know, Keith, you mentioned something about financial inclusion. And I think that's also a really important aspect as we think about remittances. Because again, there's often a perception that these customers on the receiving side are in fact unbanked. And when you look at you know a lot of the leading uh, re uh, remittance received markets, you actually see that they're highly banked. But what's interesting is now that it, it, in, the, in a number of key received markets is that you see the introduction and adoption of these digital wallets. And that has, has become a way to, to really reach traditionally, I would say underbanked consumers or complete unbanked consumers where a remittance might be really their first um, financial transaction that really allows you to kind of get in, uh, you know, be able to um, um, establish a, a financial relationship with that receiver. And so I think you know that's really the important element of uh, of you know our Visa strategy to to build out the wallet side of our network. And so as you look at those seven billion endpoints that I mentioned in my introductory remarks, about 1.5 billion of those are digital wallets um, around the world, and that's through a, a partnership that Visa did Visa announced with Tunes last fall, and that actually opens up 78 wallets across 44 countries and territories. But I think what's really interesting is when you start to look at the wallet as an endpoint for a remittance receive, in many of these markets, that is the pr primary account that the receiver uses on a daily basis. They use it to buy their transit pass in the morning, their coffee or their lunch in the afternoon. And you know, when you look at specific markets like Vietnam and Pakistan and Philippines and, and China, you actually see that these countries have or are at close of having more digital wallet adoption than even bank accounts. And then you obviously look at you know, markets like China that has a very um, sophisticated digital payments um, ecosystem that includes WeChat Pay and Alipay that have really become the, uh, the predominant methods for sending and receiving cross-border, but even to do everyday purchase transactions within you know, merchant locations. 
Now, Rich, I love what you're saying. I love the focus here being on the users, right? Especially when it comes to remittances, it's all about the users and what they want. And it, you know, if you look at what we're talking about here, and you also look at a lot of other webinars, right? You'll hear about users wanting the simplicity of embedded transactions where they do business, whether that be in the marketplace. Um, but for the remittance world, it starts in their bank account, right? So when you get paid, sending money home to your family for support perspectives really is tied directly to your pay. So we see on, on days when we have clients that, that use our services for payroll, we see big spikes in the transfers that happen. So the users want to have the services embedded where they bank. They, they're clearly saying that in the market. Um, beyond that, the other things that users want, right? With Brightwell, we integrated into five different providers. Why do we integrate into five different providers? Because users want choice. They want optionality, kind of what you're saying to, right? It's, I want the ability to be able to send to a debit card. I want to be able to send to a bank account. I want to be able to send to a wallet. I want to be able to send to a bank account. Creates a lot of complexity in the cross-border world, which we'll talk about more in just in a little while here, but users want that choice. And then beyond that, what we see our users asking for is speed, is they want to see that transaction arrive back home with their family or where it needs to be very, very quickly. And there's a lot of dynamics happening in the market right now as there is a race to real-time payments uh, globally, just like there is domestically. And then the two other things they want is transparency and visibility into those transactions. Did my money actually get there? What is the status of my transaction? And the last thing is they want a competitive price for those services. Yeah, yeah. I think there's there's so much friction in cross-border payments, right? We Hal touched on domestic um, faster payment rails. We've in the U.S. We've got RTP, we've got FedNow, but that's that's domestic only, right? For for the most part, right now. Um, outside of the card networks, there's no truly global payment rail, right? Um, the, the card networks have that, but then oftentimes it's that last mile is reliant on the, the local payment scheme, whatever that may be, that the, the local payment um, bank scheme tied to an account. Um, but I think because of that, because of the multiple hops, there is, um, a lot of friction there's that there's it's slower um there's high cost and there's not that transparency i think that is something that we see many of our our fintech clients trying to solve for because there is a huge opportunity if if someone figures out how to drive out cost how to make it more transparent um it is cross-border payments are much more complex than than domestic but if you can make it fast low cost um and and a experience where the consumer is is operating in their wallet in their phone um that's that's where fintechs will will have success um in the cross-border space whether that's remittances or or um more b2b uh use cases as well so um, one of the things, Hal, you mentioned was speed, and I think that's maybe a place to double click for just a quick second. You know, if you think about even the traditional remittance into a deposit account, oftentimes, you know, if you miss a cutoff, it might take a day or even a couple of days to receive money. So I always like to use the example of, you know, if I send a remittance at 505 on a Friday evening, you know, that money's not getting the account likely until Tuesday morning. And that's meaningful for your family or friend in the receipt market. And that's what I think is interesting around Visa Direct's capability around push to card is that is truly 24 by seven. And so money, um, uh, although it's received in 30 minutes or less in practicality, it's, it's, it, it moves in seconds. And so if I send a transaction on Friday evening to a consumer's debit card as another way to reach their account, they're getting that money in their account you know, on Friday evening. And that's a real differentiator when you start to look at, you know, across 190 markets, the ability to offer that type of capability to, to really offer new choice in the remittance space. And quite honestly, to meet that customer expectations we were talking about earlier, that customers expect money to move in real time um, and they expect it to move as easily as they send an email. I think it's a great point. You know, when you look at the different types of payments, right, when you look at two account payments, 
you've got swift transactions that are out there. We deal with correspondent banks, right? That's the, the oldest way of doing things. And swift is doing things to make those payments faster, but it's, it's, it's moving very, very slowly. Then you get into the RTP providers that Keith was referring to. And there, you know, you may have, you know, again, you're seeing speed pick up, but you may miss that deadline, like you were saying. And now the next thing you know, the money is coming on, uh, on, on, a, on a Monday or Tuesday. When you look at the cash pickup, one of the things that people love about cash pickup has been that instant nature. You can do it 24-7, 365. Um, and, and now push to card actually gives you that same benefit. The other thing that's beautiful about push to card and why we implemented and really like our partnership with Visa here is that push to card takes away a lot of the complexity of the amount of information that needs to be um, given at the time of the transaction for the money to be sent. What I mean by that, all of a sudden, I don't need to worry about going and finding the IBAN number, going to find a routing number, going and finding, I literally only need the basic information that's on that card. Isn't it? And Rich, I'm going to steal your example, right? It's like my account details are in my pocket, right? I just, they're right there in my wallet. Um, that simplicity covered with the speed, um, the great use case and the time is 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 a great is a great tool. Yeah, I, th I think um, for us as, as a bank, when when we think about cross border, um, they are more risky than than domestic payments. So, one of our primary concerns when we looked to roll out more cross border payment capabilities, because we are seeing a lot of demand for cross-border payments, is understanding how can we um, add cross-border payment capabilities in a compliant manner, right? So for payments that's specifically BSA, ML, and OFAC, um, one of the, the benefits of Visa Direct is we know at the payout end, it's in. It's going to a card issued by a Visa-sponsored bank, right? Wherever that bank may be located, we know at least that Visa has gotten comfortable with it and with that bank in that local jurisdiction, right? So we we obviously need to do our own um, compliance. Um, our OFAC scans, we can't outsource that. Um, we work with our fintechs, um, they need to do it as well. But then also there's a level of comfort that we have um, knowing that it is um, going to a card issued by, by a Visa sponsored bank. Um, the other risk would be would be the um, liquidity risk or the, the FX exposure. Um, Another benefit of, of leveraging the card rails is as we're getting into it, we don't have to worry about the FX exposure on our side. Um, building out a, a trading desk and FX desk is not a small undertaking. Um, eventually we may want to do that, but in the interim, we're able to work with, with Visa and um, the other networks to leverage those FX rates and all we have to worry about as a U.S. bank is U.S. dollars, right? Um, it's it's a never, another level of complexity to worry about FX rates. And when we talked about handling different currencies through the non-card rails, our, our accounting teams, our treasury teams, our finance teams, they, they look like deer in the headlights, right? They, they don't know where to begin with that. So uh, I think it's something that eventually we, we want to be able to support, um, but in the interim, we can offer cross-border payment uh, functionality through, through push to card. Keith, that's interesting. A lot of the, the compliance component, the technical component, the re reconciliation component, right? You're really starting to hit a lot of the challenges that are out there. And, you know, going back on, on Brightwell's story, right, it started with the complexity of doing the integrations into the different providers. It can take five, six, seven months to integrate into a single provider. And then if you need to integrate into multiple providers, right, all of that just starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Once you've got that cost absorbed, now there are a lot of complexities with data elements changing um, that are required from a regulatory perspective to make a payment go through to the end user. So you have upkeep from a technical perspective to do that as well. Um, you know, and then what's hard for a lot of banks is, is that that regulatory compliance piece. 
And you know, this is why we built Ready Remit at Brightwells, because if you will, we pre-integrated for all of our uh, our clients into the rails that you need. All the rails that we're talking about are available through, through Ready Remit. We are not a regulated entity. We are a technology enablement platform, but we have built all of the compliance tools when it comes to doing sanction screening, transaction monitoring, um, customization for the needs for disclosures and receipts, et cetera, all the way through the entire process um, to, to enable um, our clients to be able to work with the bank that actually is the remittance provider behind us um, to be able to do those transactions. So, you know, it's, it's about enablement. And I think that it's uh, when you look at cross-border, it can be daunting. And I think that the success to cross-border is finding the right partners that can bring all of the components and the right partners together to make it more efficient and easy for you to be able to implement a solution. Yeah, I think um, you're you're bringing up the, the classic uh, question of build versus buy versus partner, right? Um, and in oftentimes in this space, it's it's a combination, right? Um, in some scenarios, you're going to build, you know, crossover. We, we're a bank, but we're also a technology company. So we've got a whole bunch of an engineers. And, and typically what that means is we build things, but we know there's certain things that we don't have the competencies to build, right? Specifically in the cross-border space. So um, we've worked with Visa Direct and then, um, we're also partnering to add our capabilities with with currency cloud, right? So they can provide some of that FX. Um, but it is something that I think any any fintech, anybody looking to um, add cross border should think very thoughtfully about where you want to build um, versus where you don't want to build. How are you going to differentiate your, your product? That's typically where you're going to want to build. Um, and then the areas where you know, you can work with a third party vendor and that's not how you're going to differentiate your offering. Then, then you partner um, that helps you obviously go to market faster and keep your costs down uh, low. So, so that the build versus buy versus partner question is, is something that comes up a lot in the cross border um, times. And sometimes it's, it's first partner. And then over time, maybe you bring those capabilities in house. Um, so you can go to market quickly, but then from a cost perspective um, or, you know, adding differentiation in later, you want to, to build something in-house um, to, to support your cross-border initiatives. So Keith, if I can build on that um, idea a little bit, I 100% agree with um, your advice here to anyone that's looking to get into cross-border payments. And I think the other kind of element to that is really around scalability, because oftentimes when, in my experience, when when banks or companies enter into the cross-border um, arena, they're doing so for a very specific kind of use case or a specific, you know, small set of markets. And then over time, they look to expand into taking that use case to additional markets or adding on additional use cases. And before you know it, you have a far more complex um, um, kind of ecosystem that you're building and managing to be able to support that overall business. So I think Scalability is a really important element as you start to think about your kind of build um, uh, or partner type strategy as to thinking about the investment that you need to make in the core capabilities around your cross-border business. Where can you partner um, to be able to kind of incorporate that best of breed capability to be able to um, um, support your program? But then also thinking about, you know, where does it make sense to um, um, invest kind of in building your own um, infrastructure to differentiate, but then what's the overall um, ability to have that infrastructure flex as you build your cross-border business? And I think the other element to that is really thinking about the complexity of your partner relationships. It's one thing to connect to these partners, but you also have to manage these relationships over time. And that means everything from kind of doing your appropriate review and risk on these partners, but then as you change your systems or they've changed their system, there's technical, uh, a need for technical integration that always needs to kind of be top of mind and, and um, needs to be supported. And that's one of the interesting things around Visa Direct with one connection, you can kind of get access to all of that network across 190 um, you know, markets around the world um, that you, know, can, you can bring then to 
um, you know, be able to um, support your specific cross-border programs and um, objectives. I think that's it, that flexibility that you're talking about, right? I think it's, you know, cross-border is very complex when you start, mm -hmm. but as you build that business case and as you start to scale your business, you want to be able to take more control of your, your own program. You know, and this is where I think, you know, these types of partnerships that we built here with Visa and across and that Cross River is building, right? They give you the capability to be able to implement either an API or an SDK. How much control do you have? How much of your own branding? How important is that for you up front, right? Our SDKs are highly brandable where you can make them look very much like your solution. It's still powered by the regulated entity, but, but you have that, that control. If you want to later on, right, take on more and become your own regulated entity and take out that on and not work with a separate third party entity, right? There are systems like Ready Remit that allow you to be able to do that. If you will, you can graduate and grow without having a lot of the pains along the way that it would typically take to do that. So I think, you know, I think one of the key things, though, that I hope that the audience is taking away from this discussion is that, you know, it's really important to kind of, you know, the stakes to manage these complexities that we're talking about are even higher than ever. Um, you know, banks need to innovate to capture the market share for these cross-border payments as volume is shifting, you know, um, largely away from some of the traditional banks into the fintechs and and other types of companies, how can they offer their own cross-border payments to be able to service the needs of their, their customer as well? And, you know, Hal, to your point, this is the reason why Visa works with partners like Brightwell, like Cross River Bank, is because it provides a, um, an infrastructure that, you know, these originators can, can easily connect into and to be able to tap into the value-added services that you provide to be able to enable and, and manage these programs. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things, I mean, we've talked a lot about remittances, um, but obviously there's there's also a huge um, opportunity for, for B2B, or there is a question uh, in the chat related to wholesale payments, right? And um, we're seeing a lot of that too. And, and depending on the use case, um, the way you're going to solve the cross-border payment um, challenge is going to be different, right? Some There might be some similarities between, uh, obviously, there's FX in both or could be FX in both consumer B2C versus B2B, um, but then there's other things related to B2B use cases that would come into play, you know, so it's typically high dollar um, high dollar transactions, um, maybe while speed is important, maybe the 24 seven 365 isn't as important, right? So it's understanding which use case you're trying to solve for. And again, there's a ton of opportunity in B2B. Um, those are typically supplier payments um, to the main, manu major manufacturing geographies out in the, in the world. Um, primarily from the U.S. out, um, but there's there's a lot of um, opportunity there as well. Yeah, Keith, to that point, when you look at the SMB um, kind of uh, accounts payable a use case, that is a huge use case. I mentioned early on, that's about $433 billion out of North America alone. Largely, a lot of those payments might be check in the form of check today. Um, and so they represent an opportunity to not only build a revenue stream by offering some type of a digital first um, cross-border SMB payment, um, but also it, it, there, there's the benefit of not having to process the check and the expense on the other side, you know, of, uh, uh, you know, of the operational side of the bank. And I think when you think about those payments today and think about the, the pain points that, you know, an AP processor goes through today when having, when getting an invoice, you know, from a supplier in another currency, right, they have to, you know, if they, if they're, either sending a check or maybe they're using a traditional wire, they need to think about, well, how long is it gonna to take to clear that payment? Cause they're not gonna go in real time. They're gonna take a couple of days, right? And they need to think about what FX rate will apply to this payment as it goes through the various correspondent relationships. There may be multiple correspondents. So there may be lifting fees involved in that payment. And I like to say that the only thing that I'm sure of if I'm an AP manager and paying that invoice 
and trying to figure out how much you know I should start the payment for is that I'm going to be wrong. There's going to be an overpayment or there's going to be underpayment. And then that actually creates the need to do a second follow-up transaction, or there's a credit on a future invoice or what have you. And you see the friction from that payment kind of mounting up. So the ability to be able to provide kind of the transparency into the fees, the FX rates, the, uh, the, the transparency into the estimated delivery time for the payment by going with a digital first um, um, type of transaction just kind of allows us to be able to um, completely re-engineer how we think about that single use case emerging. And one last point here is what I think is interesting is how banks can think about that particular use case as a core feature of their business accounts. So if we all liken ourselves back to let's say 15 years ago um, in the retail banking segment, you know, banks weren't involved in bill pay. They just processed all the checks that we wrote for our bills. But then you had you know, innovative um, electronic bill payment that came forward that first went into online banking, eventually into mobile banking. And before you know it, banks are now in the business of bill payment. And one of the things that they found is that by looking at electronic bill payment is that that actually drove a more active checking account for the consumers that use the product. And in most cases, it also was the primary checking account. I do think when we think about remittances and adding it to a consumer checking account or SMB invoice payments and adding it to a small business account, we can actually see the same type of behavior where we'll increase the activity, we'll increase the value of the customers that are using that account because we're offering these digital payment services incorporated as a core feature of that account. Yeah, I think one of the things we saw with the with the pandemic is how complex our supply chains are and, and how um, maybe cross-border payments work well for large corporates, but for SMBs, which, you know, they were they were impacted with with COVID and supply chain challenges. There's there's a lot of friction and there's got to be a better way to solve the SMB payment and, and you know, Global trade is no longer just tied to large corporates. It's truly an, an SMB world now when we think about global supply chains. And I think the payment infrastructure, I mean, thinking about correspondent banking, that's just a nightmare. And again, maybe a large corporate um, can can manage that, but but a SMB uh, navigating a correspondent banking network is, is not gonna happen. So there's gotta be a better solution out there. and, and there's, there's some good ones out there right now that are being developed, for sure. It's interesting, all these use cases, right? Even in the, in the B2C world, you've got to, you've got to work with the, the complex ecosystem around them, right? When you're, when you're talking about vendor payments, now you've got the, the ERP systems and integration points, right? Um, businesses also have a harder time dealing with um, privacy data, right? Especially when we get into financial data, so, you know, things that we, we've looked at is making sure that when we are capturing the car data, that we do it in a PCI compliant way where the corporates don't have to capture that data. So, you know, anybody who's out there thinking, well, this is a big problem for them. Yeah, maybe so. But you can also say that, you know, there are already solutions that are out there that prevent that from happening. So businesses just want to move the payments. And I think the, the push to car is a great solution for that. Um, especially uh, in the B2C world, we see a lot of use cases in the in the travel sector and uh, anything that's doing anything in um, with passengers or guests, anything of that nature, refunds, um, great opportunities. But again, it's it's providing all of the different functionality on the front end of the payment and the back end of the payment. So you know these are things you have to think about. One is the payment rail. But then the other part is what value and what other you know technology do you need on the front end or the back end to be able to deliver those payments in the, in the best possible way? Yeah, hell, and you know that goes with their um, you know from the perspective of looking at kind of the value added services that you provide or that are available within the Visa Direct network, everything from you know fraud tools, um, account verification type tools or even some of the um, kind of receiver tools that can improve the experience. So things like using an alias um, rather than entering the um, a, 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 you know, account information to be able to streamline that process or you know, receiver directed payouts where a receiver um, that um, 
it captures a, a receipt can actually then determine where to, to move those funds, you know, into which account that they might own. But even thinking about, you know, other capabilities within the visa um, um, visa um, networks, such as digital card issuance, and how that tied to remittance can allow you to actually, you know, build a relationship with the receiver that is actually receiving that remittance on a regular basis. And then even thinking about how you can change the send process itself and looking at request to pay. You know, I always like to think about in a remittance, there's always a transaction before the transaction, which is the request of funds where mom calls and says, I need, I need $100 for X today. And then, you know, the sender then goes out to the bank or goes out to the remitter and then sends those funds. Well, how can you make that experience part of the digital send experience where the transaction is actually initiated by the receiver and then reviewed and authorized by the sender to be able to even streamline that side of the transaction. So that's some of the things that Visa is working on um, in this core remittance use case to be able to increase its capabilities to, to ultimately drive uh, an improved customer experience for senders and receivers. And Rich, I mean, ultimately that also, right, those types of solutions, receiver directed, you know, something we haven't talked about is fraud, right? And fraud is a is definitely a risk in, in the cross-border space as well. And something like a receiver-directed solution removes so much of that. Because now, right, for anybody who doesn't know what we mean by receiver-directed, right, at the end of the day, or with the alias, right, we're talking about um, that information not needing to be shared from the receiver to the sender. So it's all happening um, seamlessly in a more secure way. And, and those solutions are there today. And, you know, but those are all things that you need to consider um, because fraud definitely plays a role into the cross-border place as well. Yeah, and, and with the faster payment rails, um, the speed with which fraud happens can, can happen faster and faster. So if you don't have good controls in place, you will definitely be um, a victim of fraud and, and your customers will, will be victims if you're not. Um, if you're not on top of those things. I'm just going to dive into some questions here, folks. Uh, it's been really interesting here, hearing that. I think, um, Keith, we have a question for you on, you kind of touched on the, the adoption that you've seen. There's a question here that says, um, if, bank, if the banks are losing customers to fintechs and other non-regulated entities, who will build out the last mile infrastructure for complete digital utility? Um, I, I think there's going to be quite a few providers who build out that last mile um, connectivity. You know, there's ultimately to, to move dollars in the U.S., you must have an account at the Fed. Um, and so while there's been some innovative approaches to getting accounts at the Fed, um, to, to move those dollars. Now, there's a lot of things you can do on top of that, um, like run on the card rails or run on, on some stable coin rails. Um, but to, to move dollars, you need, you need to work with the, with the Fed. So there is um, going to be a, a space for, for banks, um, even, even if the client has their, their MTLs, right? So, um, whether that's a good thing or bad thing, the, the, the banks are still um, part of the, the payments infrastructure. Um, and I think that's how the regulators um, help control things like money laundering and, and um, bad actors from entering the system because however many tech layers on top, the, the regulators can go to the banks and they're the ones ultimately responsible to prevent those things from happening. And then we work with partners to, to prevent those things. Um, so whether that's, that's card rails or um, stable coin rails, um, when it comes to stable coin, let's say converting it back to fiat, you need, you need a bank on that end. So um, I don't know if that quite answered the question, but um, yeah, there, there's a lot of ways to solve that last mile uh, distribution challenge. Yeah, I would I, I would like to add, you know, that's one of the things that obviously Visa Direct is really um, focused on and the ability to be able to increase our endpoints across, um, you know, card, account and wallet. Um, and that's where we're focused on is, is being able to deliver that last mile of getting that funds directly into that 
um, into that receiver's um, bank account directly or using their card credentials to be able to move money into um, that account or you know, increasingly moving it into a wallet. And again, that's where in my opening remarks, I mentioned that's 7 billion endpoints across 190 markets with payout in 160 different currencies. I think it's going to be a combination of all of the providers and new providers, right? You have the um, the local clearing networks globally in country, right? Writing in uh, in country rails that are moving towards real times that will get hooked into to go that last mile. Um, you'll see, you know, we mentioned Swift earlier. Swift has a you know new product, Swift Go as well. So they're trying to get their speed, get their transparency um, up and going. Um, the card networks like Visa Direct, I think is still just a, a fantastic solution for so many different reasons. Um, you know, and, and the wallets um, are, are interesting because at the end of the day, right, they're also pretty easily to connect into through Visa now. And um, I think it's just, it, it's gonna be a combination of all of those rails. And then you're gonna see providers and enablement platforms hook into the Fed nows, hook into, you know, whatever the new technology is that comes out, right? Because they'll still be used for cross-border payments. Um, the question is, what's the equivalent of a Fed now in, you know, uh, India, you've got UPI in Philippines, you've got, you know, every country has its own and it's going to be connecting those networks together. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rich, I, I understand there's kind of an embedded finance element to to Visa Direct and the work you're doing with with companies like um, Finastra and Veeam. C could you discuss some of the other payment types, such as prepaid gift cards and directed payments? Um, someone in the audience here is saying that um, many customers want to pay with different methods. Um, merchants want to accept any type of digital value as well. How, how is Visa Direct kind of approaching uh, this, this new era? Yeah, well, first of all, you mentioned kind of the partner aspect, and I think that's a really important element here besides, you know, uh, Brightwell and uh, Cross River Bank is that when you think about bank ecosystems, there's ultimately uh, many banks work with certain technology providers, you know, that are in the market. And so the ability to kind of have those providers um, connect into Visa Direct ultimately provides a pathway that allows um, banks to easily, um, you know, stand up their cross-border program. You know, to the point that Keith um, mentioned earlier, it's about speed to market. You know, how can you find the, the best, easiest path method to be able to get that cross-border program up in line? And then, James, there was another side of that question as it related to cards. What was that, please? Can you repeat that? Um, so customers want to be able to pay with any digital value they currently have, be it a Starbucks gift card um, or prepaid phone credits. Um, yeah, it was just to discuss other payment types uh, that are yeah. they're there. So, so today, um, you know, within Visa Direct, um, the primary funding transaction is called an AFT. And an, an AFT is where we effectively pull funds from a debit card, a, a, a prepaid uh, card to be able to fund a transaction itself. Those are the primary methods that we offer today to be able to get money into, um, you know, to be able to fund a particular transaction. When you look at other sources of funds into, let's say, a remittance transactions, this is where you kind of look back to the banks where they may have access directly to you know, their customer's account to be able to do that direct funding, you know, within their own platforms to be able to initiate, let's say, a cross-border remittance for one of their customers. Yeah, so so I think what what we're seeing kind of across the, the payments landscape as things evolve is um, whether it's OCT on the push side or the uh, RTP or Fed now, the send is is working well, at least just um, just speaking domestically now, let's say. Um, the speed with which money can leave the bank works well, um, but obviously the pay-ins, uh, we need more faster pay-in solutions to ensure that the overall speed of the payment is still there, right? Right now it's it's AFT, which is, which is very fast, um, but then you've got ACH debits, and you can do that via, via same-day ACH, um, 
which is relatively fast, um, but there's there needs to be more faster pay in methods um, to enable the true end to end payment. Um, and, and then there is concerns, as I mentioned, things move faster, concerns around fraud um, and obviously money leaving the bank that we've seen over the last month or two. Um, you 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 want to ensure now now our bank model is a little bit different from a balance sheet perspective, um, but we do want to manage that risk as a bank um, to ensure that money is not leaving the bank too quickly. Um, if if you're the more traditional bank where you're building up your balance sheet and earning interest income. Yeah, so Keith, I mean, I think your point on fraud is spot on. I mean, that is definitely an area that you need to be really think you need to be very mindful of when you're starting to do pay in and really thinking about what type of fraud tools are available to be able to really manage that side of the business. As I mentioned, you know, Visa has a number of those tools, and I know both um, Cross River and Brightwall also have tools that can supplement there. The other element of risk that I think you know, is important to think about is, is the risk of good funds as well. And ensuring that you're using pay in methods that actually are good funds, because to your point earlier, to the speed of the payment, if you are moving the, the money, um, uh, you know, if you're, if you are funding a, a remittance to then move it cross border and very quickly, you want to ensure that you're using good funds and an AFT is a good funds model. And so that's one of the reasons why it's very widely used in the as um, in the pay in feature across both remitters, banks, fintechs, et cetera, is because of that good funds model. Uh, guys, I'm conscious just we're coming to close to the end of time, but what will be really good is just for, for Hal and Keith, just to share a takeaway for the audience of what it took you to build your business case um, for, for cross-border payments and how what advice would you give to get started? Uh, yeah, so so I mean, I would say start small, um, figure out a specific corridor or a specific use case that you initially want to to support, and then um, you know don't don't try to boil the ocean. Start small, and then figure out uh, which partners you need to enable that use case or that that corridor. Yeah, I think for for us the the takeaway was we we learned hands on right over ten years we integrated into many many different providers, um, you know and just to just to be clear right we are not the regulated entity we are a technology platform that enable regulated entities, um, so you know for us it's I think this is a clear example of where it is better to partner first than it is to try to go and build something yourself right unless you're across river who, you know, is, um, you know, a larger institution that's got, you know, the technology and has the, the banking side, I think that, you know, utilizing an enablement platform provider, um, I think makes a lot of sense. You know, we, some of the other things we didn't get a chance to get much into today is, you know, discussing about pricing. You have to think about who's going to price all of this? How do you price this? And I think that's where a lot of the, the enablement providers can really help you um, launch a program quickly, easily, and cost effectively. So, James, before we close, if I can maybe add to that too, I mean, I, I think it, you know, Keith said it, I think starting with a focus area, what is the specific cross border payment that you're trying to enable for what customer, for what client segment, for instance? And then, you know, really digging into that payment flow to understand how it might work, doing a capability assessment, both internal and partners, to figure out how do you enable that. And then that allows you to then define your ideal customer journey and experience. And that allows you to start building out your capability. But even building out your capability, you also have to kind of think about the commercialization elements of your business. You know, what is your offering, your pricing to, to house point? How will you get access to the product for your customers? And then lastly, thinking about the operational and servicing support that's needed to be to when you launch that program and really to optimize your and maximize your return on your investment. Great summary, Rich. Great. Well, that's that's really good. Maybe Rich, if you could just give a quick overview of where people can find more information about the different products and yeah, Hal, Keith, if you have any other information as well um, that you'd like to just leave with the audience. 
Yeah, the primary place to find more information about Visa Direct is on the Visa um, website. I invite you to, to link up uh, to click to there and uh, view information. And then I think James, we're also providing um, contact information to the attendees here as well. So they can also reach out directly as well. Great. If you're interested in talking to Brightwell, I think uh, brightwell.com is the easiest way to come and see what we're all about. And um, we wish everybody the best in their, uh, in their opportunity and uh, look forward to hopefully one day meeting some of these people in person. Yeah, and I would um, point anybody interested, go to our developers page, crossover.com slash developers, or I think we're going to post our email addresses. So feel free to email me. Right. So this webinar was taking is taking place in tandem with Transform Payments USA, where which is happening in Austin, Texas next week, the 13th, 14th of June. I'll be there with with Keith, with Richard. We're going to be have two days of focused discussion with 150 senior leaders. So if you're interested, um, do get in touch for more information. Uh, other than that, please keep in touch for future content. And yeah, have a great day. Thanks you all for joining. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Al. See you. Bye-bye.